Good morning. We will be in Colossians 2. We are going to start reading in verse 16. So as you turn into Colossians 2.16, I want to introduce something important about the text today. I don't know if you've noticed, but quite often the written word can be confusing sometimes. And there's something that the written word lacks. And you've undoubtedly seen this in things like emails or text messages. And the thing that it lacks is the tone of the writer. Sometimes meaning gets lost because the reader is reading it in the wrong tone. And we, we could suffer from that in Colossians 2 here if we're reading Paul's heart as being one of aggressive or yelling at his audience, which if you want to know what it sounds like for Paul to yell at his audience, read 1 Corinthians, uh, read Galatians, you foolish Galatians. That's how you read Galatians. Colossians doesn't read that way. Colossians sees his spiritual children. They have begun to, to trust in Jesus, and, yet they've, begun, and they, yet they've started to trust other things. And so he's beseeching them. He's compassionately reaching out to them. So as we read this, though I might not get it right in the reading, put, put the right tone on this. Paul is being winsome. He's being loving and compassionate. Colossians 2, starting in verse 16. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. Verse 20. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, But they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Let's pray. Lord, your word has taught us who you are and who we are in light of you. And so, Lord, today as we read this, I pray that you would open up our hearts to see what other things we're trusting to help us become more valuable. Lord, the only value we we have is you. So bring us back to yourself. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now, last week, I wanted to cover this whole section in my sermon, but I overshot my, my abilities, and I made it halfway through the sermon. And I, I'm going to give you an explanation of why that happened, and I want you to know I'm not defending myself. I totally failed. I'm going to own up to that. But there's something about that failure that teaches us how to read the New Testament. You see, the, the letter to the Colossians, again, a letter. Paul wrote a letter. He, it didn't have chapter divisions. It didn't have verse divisions. It certainly didn't have headings. Probably didn't even have a title. It probably, you just unrolled the scroll and the first thing you see is Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. This is a letter. The, the people that he wrote it to were believers. They spoke his language and they understood what he was talking about. They didn't have to split it up into little chunks to try to figure it out. All they had to do was read it. This is a letter. Now, they would catch that Paul's primary argument is that Jesus is supreme over everything. And his supremacy drives the Christian life. Again, reading that as a letter, they would have caught it. And and some of the stuff they would have caught were the fact that Paul would invent words. Paul invents a few words in this letter... And he uses them, and because they understood how the Greek language works, they would have picked them up right away. They would have known exactly what he's talking about. 
And if you have to invent a word to describe what you're talking about, that's a pretty important deal. Because the, apparently the words that you've got in your vocabulary already aren't enough. You need something new, full, complete to actually get this message across. For them, when they heard it, they would have said, there's a new word. They also would have recognized old phrases. He could have made a comment like he does here. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. And immediately they would have said, yep, I know what he's talking about there. You and I don't get that. We, we have to study a little bit. We have to dig into words. We have to look at phrases. We have to spend time in culture. We have to figure out what he's talking about. And so that means that we have to bite off little chunks of the text just to try to figure out what he's saying. But our practice of doing that often shadows, it covers over Paul's overall thrust of the letter. We get lost in the weeds we start looking at the individual trees and forget it's part of a forest. We, we, we struggle as it goes through here. And so as each small section plays an important role of his overall argument, sometimes we get stuck in the sections. We also sometimes get stuck in where the section begins and where one ends. Because if it's one argument, when does he change from this to that or this to that? It's a little bit like looking at a snake. Where does the head stop and the neck start? Or the body, or the tail. It just looks like a snake with a pointy end over here and two pointy ends on this end. Okay? It just looks like a snake to us. But in our practice of preaching through the word and studying the word, we have to try to grab segments. And last week, I just grabbed the wrong segment. It was bigger than I was expecting. And so this smaller section actually begins back in chapter 2, starting in verse 6. He's talking about what it means to have received Christ Jesus. So verse 6. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. As you've received Christ Jesus, so walk in him. Are you a Christian? Are you living like a Christian? The way Christ would define that? If you look at Jesus' ministry, he had a lot to say about what his kingdom would look like. How would you deal with a Sabbath day? How would you deal with fasting or feasting? How would, you, how would you determine who your neighbor is? What do you do with the word of God and sacrifices? How often should you forgive someone? Or is forgiveness even important? There's a lot of things that Jesus had to tell us. And they were describing what Jesus' kingdom is supposed to look like. So I would have to ask that question again. Are you a Christian? Are you living like a Christian the way Jesus would define it? That's verse 6. But this also ties back to verse 8. We see these ideas of having died with Christ and the issue of elemental spirits or simple ideas that come from the world. And so where, oh where, does chapter 2 verses 20 through 23 fit in? Because there's also something we learn, and I'll just show you a heading. This, I'm, hopefully, I'm hoping this is going to be helpful for your own study. If you look at chapter 2, verse 20. If with Christ you died. Now look to chapter 3, verse 1. If then you have been raised with Christ. You see how those are flip sides of the same conversation? You're united with Christ. You've both died with Him and have been raised with Him. So really... The, the, the section we're going to study today should have gone with what came before and it should have come with what comes after. So, again, I tell you this so that you would be encouraged in your own reading, in your own study, to recognize this is a connected thought. This is a flow of thought. He's making an argument. And so often we get stuck digging in the weeds and we miss the big deal. So again, that's not a defense for why I messed up last week. I just flat out messed up. But I want you to know that if you mess up, you're not lost. You can open up your Bible again and jump back in. If you're studying for a, uh, to teach a Sunday school class, teach a Bible study, uh, do some discipling with somebody, hang on the word, be solid on it. Okay, And, and you got to know, even if you're going to try to describe it or explain it, there's something important to realize. 
In this sermon, there's only one part that's totally infallible and totally perfect. And that was the time where we read the text. As soon as I start talking, we've got doubt. So, we've read the text. We have, we have what God said to the Colossian church through Paul. And in verse 20, Paul, Paul lands on something. He's about to tell them what it takes, or he's going to continue the thought of what it takes for a Christian to endure the crazy world we live in. Verses 16 through 19 talked about how we need to stand confidently on Christ. He's everything that we actually need. He's the only valuable thing we have. In Christ are everything that we need. But once we get to verse 20 through the end of the chapter, Paul introduces what, what I call a discerning assessment. A Christian needs to be able to look at what the world is telling us, what the Bible is telling us. We need to be able to be discerning about what's true and what's not. Because what we believe to be true is going to affect our lives. And so, quite simply, if you want to get one thing out of the message today, if you're a Christian, if you have been freed from the world's control, it's time to stop obeying its rules. Now, I drove cement mixer for a few years, and I have lots of fun stories to tell. But some strange stories to tell also. I got to meet... Um, it was a family, a rather large family, from northern Europe. And back home, when they pour concrete, it arrives in a dump truck. And they just dump it in a big pile on the ground. And now it's time for the shovels and wheelbarrows to kick in. And there's lots of raking and sweating involved in doing concrete. And I showed up at a place with a 10-yard batch of concrete. I mean, that truck was full. And I don't know if you've ever noticed, but concrete trucks have the ability to put concrete kind of wherever they want. You can swing it back and forth. Very effective. Unless you're pouring concrete for that family and you just dump it all in one spot. And then they get out the wheelbarrows and the, the shovels and, and the rakes and the sweating and they spread it out. Granted, that was the fastest unload I've ever done. It was probably about 30 seconds, and that truck was empty. They had a lot of work ahead of them, though. And I asked them a couple of times, you know, I can, I can scoot this truck over. I, I, can, I can put it in almost every spot of this basement here. Nope, nope, this is how we do it. Okay? You, the, the thing that they believed to be true affected the way that they lived. I've got another one for you. I don't, I don't know that I'm going to get all the specifics right on this, but I have some, well, I had some grandparents who lived through the Depression. And during the Depression, you learned to be rather frugal. But the Depression ended. And this couple, by the time they passed away, were worth um, north of a million dollars. They, they had some money. And one, I think it was Christmas, my grandmother received some shrimp. I think it was shrimp. It was a little Kansas shrimp, cocktail shrimp. And she knew where those cans of shrimp were purchased from, and she also knew the other um, place in town where you could buy shrimp was cheaper. So she actually returned that shrimp and went over and bought shrimp from the other place and saved herself. Well, actually, she didn't even buy it. But a few cents per can. She probably spent more on the fuel that it took to, to do the big exchange than she saved on the shrimp. But what kind of a mindset drove her to do something like that? It was a mindset built on a Depression-era view of being frugal. And, and those, I, I, I share those not to ridicule anyone, but to ask the question, what kind of a kingdom are you living in? What are the priorities? What are the rules? What is the expectation? What's, what world, what kingdom are you living in? Now, it's worthy to note as we get going here that all mankind has noticed that there's a problem. Now, the Bible would call that problem sin, but the world recognizes there's a problem. And so we, we have medicine and science and philosophy and, and we, we have every single area of the world trying to 
figure out how to fix the big problems in life. The whole world knows there's problems. But only the Bible knows how to describe those problems, and yet it's still worthy to note it's a noble thing to try to fix problems. That, that's part of the human experience, to, to identify something that's a problem or a weakness and, and have, have a desire to fix it. But what Paul here is saying is all that the world can offer, all of it, does nothing to stop this is the end of it. It does nothing to stop the indulgence of the flesh. Okay, worldly ideas cannot pr produce spiritual maturity. Now, again, this is all still background, but if, if we can remember back a few weeks ago, we saw that Paul was talking about the believer's union with Christ. You've died with him, you've been raised with him, you are united to him, and that's what it means to be a Christian. You're united to Christ. We also talked about last week in, in 16 through 19 this idea of worldview. Again, what is it that you believe to be true about reality and how does that affect the life that you live? And so here in this section, we see the connection between our union with Christ and our worldview. With those two things combined, we, we come back to that question again. If you're a Christian, are you living like a Christian? Are you... Are you Maybe we could use the illustrations from last week. The illustrations were a law book, a rule book, a structure, or a skeleton. What, what's the skeleton of your life? Are you relying on the truths of Scripture, or are you relying on the, the inland northwest priority of hard work? Is that what defines you? What, what about of your conservative politics? Is, is that what defines you? Well, what about the priority that you set for your children of education? Is, ed is education the great savior? Well, what about, what about cleanliness? Right? Is, is cleanliness really next to godliness? Paul is drawing a question mark on all of these things because none of them are explicitly Christ. And so we should all, every one of us, hear, again, Paul's tone. He's being winsome. He's not accusing, but he's still asking the question, what are you trusting in? You're united with Christ, so where does your worldview fit into this? So again, verse 20, if with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? That question, why do you submit to the world's rules? Why are you walking in their system? Why are you following their priorities? Why are you living the way the world does? Again, not, not an accusation of anybody in particular, but honestly an accusation of all of us. All of us have to ask ourselves, what are we actually trusting in? You're a Christian. We need to stop thinking like a worldling. We're Christians. Now, verse 21 is an interesting one. Most of our translations will have quotation marks here. Quote, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, unquote. That's how most of our translations are going to write this. And, and there's a little bit of a debate on what Paul means by this. Is, is he saying that they have a, the, the, these false teachers who were coming into the Colossian church, did they have kind of a three-tiered view of their rules? We have the do not handle rules, the do not touch rules, or taste rules, and the do not touch rules. Maybe it's three distinct categories of the rules that you should follow if you're going to make God like you. Which, by the way, as we get into this, that might sound like some Christianity that we were raised in or maybe that we still function in is based on the what I don't do's. Okay? Again, no direct accusation there, but let's just be aware of our own hearts in this. So these are either three individual categories or this is a saying. And this actually seems to look like a saying. So if, somebody, if you were talking to somebody, they would say, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. And, and what they mean by that most likely is that as we engage in life, we have to be aware of what's going to make us unclean. Okay. 
as, as we just think about that, the Pharisees accused Jesus of eating with unclean pots and not washing his hands. And Jesus' response was, it's not what goes into a man that defiles him, but what comes out. What we're going to get at is your heart is the issue, not what's going on with the flesh. Again, we're just building the, the thinking around this. So let's look at these individual things. Do not handle things. The word handle means to interact with a, with a something in such a way as to leave a permanent mark. Okay? It's almost like saying, don't eat that pizza. Very spiritual example there. I know we're going to use the pizza more. Okay? Do not handle. Do, do not leave a permanent mark on it. Don't eat the whole pizza. But then don't taste. This is to interact with the thing in such a way as to leave a temporary mark. Okay, the, the, the influence would essentially become meaningless after a while. This would be like uh, taking a small bite or even licking the pizza. Okay? Don't interact with it even to that extent. And then the last one is don't touch. Touching is interacting with something but leaving no distinguishable mark. D don't even touch the box of pizza. Okay? Don't don't be in the same room as the pizza, right? Now, again, look at, look at verse 23. These indeed have an appearance of wisdom. We would look at that and we'd say, yes, I see what you're saying there. That's a great idea. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. That'll be my new saying, okay? That actually looks pretty good sometimes. What Paul here is saying, though, is, what you deal with on the physical outside can't affect the heart. So, so in verse 22, a lot of our translations are going to have parentheses. Okay? Paul has this little side note to point out. If your primary rule for life is do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, you have to own up to the fact that anything that you interact with is going to burn in fact, the, the word it'll be used up as it's handled is, is like uh, when you're pulling Kleenexes out of a box, you eventually get to the last one. And you've used it up. If, if for some weird reason you had some spiritual rule about Kleenex, your rule's going to end because the box is eventually going to be empty. Right? Oh, your pot is clean. You can now eat out of it. And that's so great. And then a bug flew by it. Is it unclean? Did the uncleanness just leave? I don't know if it's clean anymore. The cleanness that this kind of false teaching presents goes away. In fact, I don't know if you've noticed, if you take a clean bowl out of the shelf and put it on the counter and make, let's say, pancakes, a pancake batter in it, your bowl is now not clean. Everybody's undoubtedly noticed that before. I've also noticed in our house, for some reason, the whole kitchen isn't clean anymore. Okay, as, as people who think this way about all these extra rules they add to themselves, they have to own up to the fact that even, even those rules themselves are going to go away. They're limited. The second thing they're going to have to realize is, even if I were to succeed in protecting my physical body for a hundred years, it's going to die. Referring to things that all perish as they were used. This is according to human precepts and teachings. And those human precepts and teachings look good on the outside. This is essentially the answer to Paul's rhetorical question. He had asked at the beginning, are you a Christian? Why are you living like somebody who follows the world's rules? Verse 23 answers that. These indeed have an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion. Now, if you've got that kind of a translation, it's actually slightly off. The word he uses here is just religion. Right? James says that there's a good religion. Right? He just says religion. We understand, though, that he's talking about the kind of religion where I set up the rules and I follow my own rules and I'm going to prove to myself that I'm really acceptable in God's sight. These are self-made religion. The next word is asceticism. Asceticism could be translated humility. Ooh, humility is a good thing, right? Well, actually, 
the way Paul's talking about it is this is the kind of humility that actually tries to injure myself to prove that I'm a good person. Right? The, the Roman Catholic Church actually added so much to this that it turned into what's called self-flagellation, where you would beat yourself or whip yourself. Or if you've ever seen Monty Python in the search for the Holy Grail, they hit themselves in the face with boards. Great comedy right there. And none of you should watch it. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. <laughs> Self-made religion, asceticism, severity to the body. If you were to do that kind of a thing, you've done nothing to actually get at the heart. Okay? If, if, you've, if you've got a, a predisposition toward lust or adultery... Taking a vow of celibacy does you no good because you still have a desire within you to engage in a sinful way. If, if you have something in you that just yearns for alcohol, not going in a bar doesn't actually change that. Okay? If, if you <laughs> deeply hate your neighbor, moving doesn't actually remove the hate. If you're stuck in drugs, moving doesn't change that. Dealing with the outside can do nothing to stop the indulgence of the flesh. Now, Paul had introduced these things in, in chapter 2, verses 4 and verses 8 as plausible arguments. They sound great. And for the most part, they don't seem to be that bad for us. I mean, honestly, wouldn't you be better off if you would just not uh, get drunk? Or, or if you wouldn't ever you know, kill someone, that would be better. But we still haven't engaged your heart. So you might look at some of the times throughout the history. Again, the reformers in the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, they saw these man-made ideas in the Roman Catholic Church and they said, we're going to have nothing to do with that. Okay? Today, you could have people walk on your doorstep, Mormons, you could even have Muslims. All of these great sounding ideas send people to hell. They are false. Rationalism and science. Claiming that something's only true if we can describe it or test it or prove it. Is, is going to do you no eternal good. By the way, science is not the authority. It's, it's not the final authority in all reason and proof. Science has always been designed... To testify to its creator. If your so-called science is rejecting your creator, it's pseudoscience and it should be rejected. Nothing wrong with science. Nothing wrong with actual science. It's actually a very good thing. Man, you look through the history of scientific endeavor, it's believers who are finding all of the things that God had put in this creation. Now, we also live in a world today, and I would love to get everyone's opinion about this, of what, is the, what are like the three biggest issues or rules in the culture that we live in today? I had the opportunity to ask some folks. One, one person said, um, science, self, and um, issues like racism and sexism. Those are the big three in the culture that we have today, and I, I don't know that I would disagree with that person. I had somebody get more specific in the self things. I'm going to self-identify and be true to myself and advance myself. And I kind of think that's what our society is built on today. To where somebody might disagree with you, but if, you're, if you are true to yourself, there you go. That's something. We also uh, have a culture that loves to talk about tolerance. Tolerance, the word tolerate means put up with something you hate. If you were to tell your wife you tolerate her today. <laughs> I, just, I just tolerate everything you say. You'll, you'll learn quickly that that's the wrong word to use there. And yet our culture treats tolerance like it's the greatest form of love. So much so that I'm not only going to put up with your ideas that I hate, I'm supposed to agree with you somehow. Which tolerance works everywhere except when you deal with Christians. 
And we find uh, just what D.A. Carson calls the intolerance of tolerance. These worldviews are dangerous and they will destroy your life. But know this. If you, you can find somebody who's got a worldview, whether it's religious or scientific, and they're good at following it, and when you look at them from the outside, they're going to look great. Right? Everything's going to be in order, and I mean, just, that's a beautiful person right there, and they do what they're supposed to do, and he, when it comes right down to it, he's a pretty good guy. Okay? But I guarantee you, if you were to see that person's heart, you would find a totally different story Making yourself look good on the outside doesn't actually change the inside. The sinful heart still needs a forgiving Savior and a disciplining Heavenly Father and a diligent Holy Spirit to finish the work that they began in us. Life is designed to change. Seeking change by man-made rules might be foolish, but, but there's actually something about that that's noble. We do desire change, and so I even want to admit right now, my guess is every single person in this room has recognized sin in your life, and you've actually taken steps to stop that sin, or you've given up, and now you just justify it. That's just who I am. Okay? Every one of us needs to recognize we've seen our own sin. That said, you might look around here and see beautiful people, with everything put together and all wonderful, but you need to know we're all broken by sin. And so are you. So welcome to the people of God. But we all also desire to be perfected by God. We desire to let the word speak to us. And because our Heavenly Father does discipline His children, we're all broken by sin. But God's at work in us. So again, welcome to the people of God. We are, are going to go through this together. And yet we, we come back to this question. What, what kingdom are you living in? What set of rules are you following? Where's your perspective or mentality? Because living in Christ's kingdom is where Christians are. Let's look back at Colossians 1.13. Colossians 1.13. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have re redemption, the forgiveness of sins. What, qu what kingdom do you live in? You live in Christ's kingdom if you're a believer. We shouldn't be following the rules of the world. Now, the rules of the world are interesting. They... They cause us to see falsehood and think it's true. And so we need that discerning assessment. We need to be able to understand the word and be filled with it and think the way the Bible does. So that when the world comes in, we can recognize the difference between the two. And when you've been simmering in the scriptures, you can see it more readily. So let's think a little more about some of these specifics that he deals with here in Colossians 2. Because he dealt with rules. He dealt with a problem. He, he dealt with where this is supposed to take place. And so we have to be honest. The biblical teaching is that man's big problem is man's own sin. It's not stuff on the outside. It's not bad health. It's not bad genetics. It's not poverty. Isaiah 59 2 says, Your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Sin is the big problem. Even if the world was willing to admit that, they're going to accuse something else of being the source of that problem. They would say it's culture or environment or lack of education. That's reflected in all of the laws that, that our government try to enforce to build things up. If only we had equal finances, then we'd be okay. Actually, the Bible's pretty clear. The source of man's problem is his own heart. Right? That's why Ezekiel has so much to say about this. And actually, Jeremiah introduces this idea. 
Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? The human heart is the big problem, and that's part of the gospel. Our salvation is the only thing that produces real change. Ezekiel talks all over the place about when God brings this salvation, a new heart is what he puts in us so that we will walk in God's ways. Man's problem is sin, and his, the source of that sin is his own heart. And so where do rules fit in? Paul is given here specific rules. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. But is he saying all rules are evil? Well, actually, I don't know if you've ever paid attention to the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 20. Go into all the world. Right? Making disciples. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And teaching them to obey all that I've commanded. Okay? A disciple is someone who obeys Jesus as his king. There are such things as rules. But we have to understand what Christ is talking about when he says rules. If, you, if you're like, oh, any rule is okay, you're going to run away from Christ. But if we say no rule should ever be given, Paul will have lots of things to say to you. And he does. And so if you're thinking no rules, read 1 Corinthians and Feel the weight of that burden. There is still, still a kingdom to live in. There's still ways that Christ's kingdom functions. There's, there's a way that Christ's people look and act and treat one another. And so, granted, we put no confidence in the flesh. That's Philippians 3.3. 3. We still engage in some rules. Now, you might have a weakness for something. You might have, say, a weakness for food. Okay? You might set yourself up some rules, like I'm only going to eat this certain amount, or, or I'm, gonna, I'm not going to eat this kind of food, or I'm not going to eat it during this time. Or, and so you might have yourself a rule. Awesome. Good job. I hope you build some self-control there and gain some health and some vitality and engage in life. Great idea. But if you, at the end of that period, say, I ate correctly, now God's going to like me, you have a problem. Here's another one. Your rule on food is only for you, not someone else. You can't hold somebody else accountable for their eating habits. Why? Because they're united with Christ. Christ has reconciled that person to God. Christ has died for that person and with that person. They've been raised with Christ. They've been seated with Christ in the heavenly places. Applying your rule of food to them does them no good whatsoever. Okay? This is also true of basically any other rule. If you have a problem with pornography, and therefore you have rules about your smartphone and your computer, awesome. But to claim that all computers are evil and therefore they are all uh, only to be thrown away, and that you yell at your brother or your sister because they have, still have a smartphone, come on. That person's been united with Christ. Taking their smartphone away isn't going to change anything. Okay? That, that conversation could go on forever. Rules can be helpful, but they don't make you saved. Now, if you're going to use rules, realize that rule is going to go away. That rule is going to go away. If I can gain the self-control to eat right, my, my eating rule goes away. I simply walk the way I'm supposed to walk. Pay attention to how rules are designed to work, but also know this. If you set yourself up a rule and you fail, 1 John 1, 9 says, you have somebody who's going to listen to you and he's going to love you, okay? And he is ready to forgive you because you belong to him. Be encouraged to engage in that life. Maybe rules, maybe not rules, but you're united with Christ. Okay, the last issue I want to deal with here is heart change being a congregational issue. Congregational issue. Okay, the false teachers were teaching these false rules to the whole congregation. Paul is writing his defense of biblical Christianity to the whole congregation. We even find throughout Jesus' ministry and the life of the apostles, dealing with sin is a congregational issue. We don't think of it that way, though. We think about it individually. 
I'm struggling with my thing, I'm gonna deal with my thing, you deal with your thing, and we're just gonna be separate. But Jesus said in Matthew 18, if your brother sins against you, you go to him. If he doesn't listen, you take somebody else with you. Oh, where did the individualism go? You just got thrown out the window. If he still doesn't listen to you, present him to the church. Oh, now, now we have the congregation not attacking this guy for his sin, but pleading with him. Step away from this sin. It's ruining you. And they're, they're being winsome and they're pulling and they're, they're holding him accountable and they're engaging in the congregational influences over sin. Congregational issues, or sin is dealt with by the whole congregation. By the way, that's scary. For you to know what my sin is is scary. But we also know that within a family, every family member understands the weaknesses of all the other family members. And if that family loves this person, they're going to engage with them in such a way as to pull them from the pit of hell if they can. The congregation are the ones who deal with this. The world doesn't think that way. The Bible thinks that way, though. So if you're a Christian, I would encourage you to think those ways. And the way that you can know that is by immersing yourself in the word of God. And you'll find that when we see Christ and what his kingdom is supposed to look like, we find that he has the authority. He is the perfect sacrifice. He is holy. He is humble. He is just. He is sacrificial. He is loving. He is true. The list can go on and on and on. We live in light of those truths because that's the kingdom we live in. We've been taken out of the kingdom of darkness. And we've been placed in the kingdom of light. And so now, if you will, turn with me to 1 John 1. 1 John 1. John is, is writing to churches. This is undoubtedly a letter that would be spread around. He's defending his own right to speak as, a, as an apostle, but he's also pointing at the message of Jesus Christ. And he's essentially dealing with if you're, if you're a Christian, how are you supposed to live? 1 John 1, 5 is where we'll start. This is the message that we heard from him, meaning Christ, and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If you're going to claim to be a Christian, Paul and John um, are, are pleading with you. Throw away your worldly ways of viewing the world. Throw away the, the great ideas that came from other people and hold squarely and firmly to the scriptures. And as you learn to trust in those scriptures and to think that way and to engage in life in that way, may we all here become a solid church, freed from the control of the world, that we might follow Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Lord, your word is a light to our feet. It's a lamp to our path. It guides us in the way that we should treat one another, and it's beautiful. Lord, help free us from our dependence on the world's truth. They don't know what they're talking about. But many of us here have been convinced that the world does know what it's talking about. So, Lord, strengthen us to put away worldly ways of thinking and to take up biblical ways of thinking that we might be set free to glorify you. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen.